it's 1030, so we will go ahead and get started with today's call. One, a couple quick reminders, actually. Um, one, reminder that when you're submitting questions or comments during today's call, please make sure you send those to all panelists. And the second piece is, for those of you that um, have been asking about the the recordings for the recent connection training webinars that were held on May 9th and May 11th. Those have been posted on the divisions connection webpage. Um, and we are currently working on the question answer document that will capture um, the responses to the questions received during those webinars. So we hope to have those posted that document posted next week. So stay tuned for that. We'll let you know when that comes out. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Angie to provide an update. Thank you, Heike. Good morning, everyone. Um, happy Friday. And hopefully everyone is ready for the weekend. I'm going to try to get my video starting. We've been having some technical difficulties, so we'll see how long it works. Um, I just have a couple of things that I want to go over with everyone this morning, and you may have already seen it or heard about it, but um, I figured it's always good to continually hear about it. Um, but, of course, it is budget. Um, High-level details that is all we have right now. We're still working through um, understanding um, some of the intent of things that were passed. So, again, I'll just go through these fairly quickly and, and high levels. So, we did receive funding for the um, rate standardization that we've already been doing. So, that's to continue um, with the rates that we're at today but it is using general revenue instead of the one-time enhanced FMAP funding. So we were pretty excited about that. Um, and then it also covers um, value-based payments, picking up um, that under general revenue rather than using the HCDS enhanced FMAP. So that's continuing all of those value-based payment initiatives that we have, trying to, to get the, the quality outcomes. DDHCBS enhancements. Um, was another one. This was, I should have gone through the dollar amounts. The first one, the rate standardization was 264 million total. The DD value-based payments is 60 million total. The HCBS enhancements, this was for the um, update that we did to the waiver application for home modifications, and then as well as our provider review contract, which Columbus is doing this. That is 14.3 um, million. Again, to continue doing those instead of using one-time enhanced FMAP funding. For new items, we have the utilization increase. That, that's a standard request we send every year. Um, we received 97.8 million. What the department had requested um, from, it was decreased by 25% um, in what is going to be truly agreed and finally passed. So, I think we'll be fine on that. We are running the numbers to update how many waiver slots that equates to. Uh, DD moving expenses, $89,000. That's really to relocate some administrative staff in regional offices at Northwest to, to some leased and state-owned space. We have also our DD um, HCBS additional enhancements. This was, or this one is for the upcoming DD Health Home that we're um, working on implementing. Um, originally, we were looking at starting that January 1st, but just with system work and then the timing of things, it looks like it'll be more like April 1st of this next year, but a lot of work is still taking place to get that going. So, $4.4 million there. And then we did receive funding for several autism lines. So, autism research, $10 million for um, a Missouri University for research and developing therapeutics and, and evaluations for for autism, we've got the Rolla Autism Center. That is $500,000 general revenue um, to be located in Phelps County. We have St. Louis County Autism Center, a build for um, $5 million. It's a one-to-one -one match for, um, for that area, and that would be for an autism center located in St. Louis County. And then our tuberous sclerosis, um, that had an increase, so it's $250,000 GR. Um, that increase, that additional funding is for the, again, the research that WashU has been, has been doing over the last several years. This is going to be um, opened up um, for, for um, we'll have to put out an RFI to see, to, to look for interest in, in that increased amount. So, I'm working on that. The other pieces, just with our regular supplemental requests, um, we had some technical 
technical components where they've moved like our provider relief fund. This was one that we got last year. It was $3 million, but it got deposited into the wrong account, so we couldn't actually use it. So anyway, they're fixing that. Um, the DD um, moving expenses, again, that 89000 we did it in both just in case um, it didn't get approved in time for supplemental. Typically, supplemental gets approved before your budget. It kind of all got approved around the same time, so that's okay. We, we will take it. There was $2.5 million added to the budget for this next fiscal year for community support services, and that is for the planning and designing and construction of um, a building to provide adult daycare services. Um, in the Joplin area, um, and that would be for individuals with developmental disabilities. So that is, that's a high level summary. I think overall we felt like it was a very good year for the division. Um, we, uh, the biggest piece, the biggest win for us, I think, is the fact that we were able to um, not have to go back. They, they, they uh, did the cost to continue with general revenue, so we don't have to go back next year to ask for um, new funding for something that we're already doing. And then we do have the rate increases. Um, they did $172 million. I think I missed that one. I apologize because that's a big one too. $172 million they put into the budget for, um, for pro provider rate increases. So that one, um, it didn't, doesn't quite align with the, the rate studies that we have. It's a different amount. So we're having to kind of work through different scenarios to see what, um, where that that dollar amount, that funding can land us on the dollar amount for the, the rates. Um, and so, again, we're working on some funding for that. And um, we'll keep everyone posted, or some scenarios for that, we'll keep everyone posted as we figure out where that gets us to our rate. So, um, the other thing that I think is important is that, oh, so here's something else that would probably be good for everyone to know is that, you know, over this next month, the governor will be signing the bills, and so they'll be going. He'll be going around to the different locations for bill signing, and so um, we'll see if any of our areas show up on that list, um, and, and where he might go for some of those. So that'll be exciting to see. So continue watching where he might um, land for those. The other piece that I wanted to talk to you about because this just came out this week. This was the Medicaid eligibility newsletter. And so I know we've put that out there for everyone to sign up for that, um, but the newsletter did go out, and I, I think we were going to send that out in an email blast as well. So we'll be sharing that if we haven't already, probably already has, but if we haven't already, I'll um, be sharing that. And that's just giving an update on how Family Support Division has been processing the, um, the annual renewal. And so the other thing that that for us, our eligibility specialist here at the department has created a report. We used to have a report that would show those that were coming up um, with their Medicaid renewals that were due. Um, we weren't quite sure how those changes were going to impact that report. So there is a report now um, that, that shows all of the individuals that need to return a renewal by June 30th. And so those have gone out to our central or to our regional offices and to PCM tax, and they're going to um, be reaching out and trying to work with everyone to make sure those renewals get in. Um, I, those typically should have been if, if addresses weren't up to date in the systems or they weren't able to get the information that they needed, FSC wasn't able to get the information they needed, these are ones that they, actually, that they need to process and work with, with the individuals and families. So I know our team is working on that. They're looking at those. They saw those reports out in the folders. There might be some TCM agencies that may see some of those in their folders, um, but again, we'll um, have the team working with you on that to make sure we understand everything that's in there. I'm trying to get clarification if that's going to be a monthly report or if it's just a one-time report they were able to get us now. I think it'll be monthly, but we will continue to keep everyone posted. And I will, I've got some high-level numbers here, I think, if I can get it to pull up. I think it was around 1,100 individuals um, that we serve through the division that need to that we need to work on getting their annual renewals in. So I didn't think 1100 was too bad, but we also want to make sure we get those in so we don't lose our eligibility. So um, with that, I think I will hand it off who is next. Oh, let me see if there's questions. Hold on. Um, there is a question about the TCM rate increase for next year. There, there was, 
there was they did not add funding for the T for a TCM rate increase. So that did not pass. That that wasn't a recommendation through um, through the process at the General Assembly, and so there was not funding added for the TCM rate increases. It was for the waiver service providers. So uh, we'll continue to work with um, rate studies and the TCM entities um, on our on the needs. So um, okay. With that, let me see, who do I pass this off to, Heike, next? Is this, let me see, Jackie? Jackie, yes. are you ready? All right, thank you. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, Angie. Hi, I'm Jackie Heitman. Um, I am the statewide business office lead. Um, I want to talk to you all today about um, some exciting uh, structural changes that we're looking to implement for um, our business offices across um, the state. So all uh, all five regions and the six satellite offices as well. So I'm gonna try and go ahead and share my screen with you so you can um, have a better visual of, of what we're looking to implement. Okay, so, so. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yes, excellent. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, as many of the other departments um, are doing and have already done, we are taking a look at the different tasks that land in the business office realm and sort of identifying first um, what are things that um, are working well for us in our current um, structure? What are things that are not working well? What are things that we're doing differently in one region versus another region? And sort of identifying um, how we can make some improvements or take advantage of the successes that um, one region may have and another one might still be struggling with. So with that, we have come up with a plan to um, sort of change up the structure of how um, we are doing business office processes and, um, you know, how we're communicating with TCMs, um, provider agencies, and um, even just the internal stakeholders. So um, I will uh, continue on. Um, I just wanted to make everyone aware of who the new fiscal manager contacts are for each of the regional offices. We um, have had some exciting promotional changes over the last year or so, and um, many of you may not have had an opportunity yet to meet um, your new fiscal manager, so I did want to at least give you each of their names. Um, so, like I said, I am um, Jackie Heitman, and I am the... Um, statewide business office lead. Um, I am out of central office, but I'm actually located in the Kansas City Regional Office. Um, so that's where I'm uh, officially housed. And then we have Jill Fair, who is the fiscal manager for CMRO, um, and that includes Rollick and Kirksville as well. And Leela Hughes um, is the fiscal manager in Kansas City and in the Albany Satellite Office. And then we have Lindsay Curdy, who is the um, fiscal manager in St. Louis and um, over Hannibal as well. Dana Pennington in Poplar Bluff and Sykeston. And then um, Debbie Evans is the newest um, to our team and she will be overseeing the Springfield and um, Joplin regional office and satellite office. Okay, so um, this is kind of a breakdown of what we are looking to do overall. Um, so instead of the current setup where everything is very much focused around um, completing all of the um, business office operations, um, one regional office um, acting independent in some instances of the other regional offices, what we've decided to do is maybe look at the tasks instead and the different um, commonalities that each of these little um, slices of the business office do. And with that, we are going to break out into five different departments. Um, you'll note that we had five fiscal managers. So each one of our fiscal managers will be heading one of these departments up. Um, the first group is the Medicaid billing team. And I've got kind of a, a breakdown of, of the staff numbers that will go into each one of those groups. Um, this team will be um, in charge of all things Medicaid billing. So any of the billing inquiries that you have when you have um, 
something that has a Medicaid rejection or you haven't received payment for it or you're having trouble billing, this is the team that you're going to go to. Um, so, in addition to the inquiries, um, we're also going to put together some um, billing training for um, primarily for new providers as they onboard, but also for existing providers if, if there are questions there as well. Um, we will be responsible for the um, Medicaid um, reinvestigation questions. Um, we'll be completing variances. We will be creating spend downs. Um, helping with ResHab days, um, that is kind of transitioning off of our plate as far as um, the payee transition goes as well. Um, we'll be do, doing shared unit billing and um, different rate projects as well. Um, right now, you know, this last year, we've had a lot of really exciting rate increases, which um, is um, excellent to be able to pass on, but it does take a number of staff hours to try to get all of those rate increases in place. And so we will have a um, project team as part of this Medicaid gr billing group that will um, work specifically on trying to help implement those, those rate changes. So then the next um, group is the fiscal team and the fiscal team is gonna be more internal for state staff. Um, they're primarily going to be focused on um, setting our budgets for um, how we pay our staff. Um, so our payroll, they're going to be working on how they, um, how we pay our um, expenses. So, you know, we're keeping the lights on, keeping um, computers on hand, things like that. They're going to be in charge of setting those budgets and making sure that our internal bills are being paid. Um, they're also going to handle um, the financial side of, of hiring new staff members. Um, and then the third team is the facilities team. Um, sort of a similar role as fiscal has where they're really managing um, more of the internal activities of the regional offices. So we'll have this group managing our um, our fleet or um, all of our cars. Um, they will be managing like any of our facility needs, any of our internal contracting as far as, you know, getting um, janitorial staff um, to help with our buildings and, and things of that nature. And then um, the fourth group is the consumer banking team. The consumer banking team is tasked with um, any budget inquiries, um, kind of opening that shell of the budget, um, processing those uh, requests for expenditures, um, if we are payee, um, doing all the receipt tracking. Uh, this group will be processing um, choices and autism project um, requests. They will also be doing reconciliations, um, sending out those 1500 reports each month, showing who might be getting close to exceeding their asset limit. Um, and they'll also be working with those interdivisional agreements as well. And then the last team is our payee team. And on this team, this, this group is gonna primarily focus on the social security benefit and the things that go along with that, meaning um, they will be working on those payee transfers. As I said before, we are getting out of the payee business and we've been doing a lot of um, transition, whether it's maybe to a parent or guardian or to a provider agency or you know a, another um, trusted individual in that, that person's life. Um, so they are helping with a lot of those transitions. They are going to be working on any social security requests um, when social security calls and asks for, you know, um, bank balances, or if they are asking for, um, you know, if someone's working, we're going to be sending them wages um, and just general um, social security inquiries. Um, this group is also going to be working on um, uh, completing the fiscal and um, quarterly spending ledgers as well. So they'll be the, this will be the group that will be out doing your fiscal reviews if we are still payee. Um, and um, once we are out of the payee business completely, which I do think maybe, you know, sometime from now, but we do have some additional tasks that I think um, we would like to have this group focus on um, primarily around, you know, the, the payee role itself. So um, more to come on that part. Um, and then I wanted to just highlight um, in this next slide, the Medicaid billing team. So we have split this um, transition up into three parts. So the first part to transition is um, the Medicaid billing department. 
And that move is actually going to um, start taking place June 1st. So this is coming up. Um, and I sort of wanted to break down a little bit um, what this looks like since this is the first group to go. So the fiscal manager that will be heading this um, team up is Leela Hughes. Um, and she has three supervisors in approximately 14 staff that will be working on this group across the state. Um, we have put together two group mailboxes that we are going to use. Um, this will help us with um, kind of identifying volume, of course, to make sure that we have an even workload. Um, it will also make sure that we are able to track that all um, inquiries have been responded to or resolved. And um, that is very important to us to know um, that we really are getting back to um, our stakeholders in a timely manner. Um, it'll also help us identify if we have continued um, repeats of like similar questions. So maybe we know that something, some communication that we have sent out is unclear, and that gives us an opportunity to maybe do some follow up training. So those teams are um, broken out by East and West, the East team. And I have the um, mailbox um, address here, which is um, hopefully fairly easy to remember. It's East Billing Team at dmh.mo.gov. And that will be made up of St. Louis, Hannibal, Sykeston, and Poplar Bluff. And then we have the West Team. Again, um, fairly easy to remember, hopefully. West Billing Team at dmh.mo.gov. And that will cover Kansas City, Albany, CMRO. Kirksville, Rolla, Springfield, and Joplin. So what that means is if your individual is assigned to the um, Albany Satellite Office, you would send your inquiry to the West team. And, um, and that way we'll kind of um, have those assigned out by, um, by location or by provider agency within those two billing teams. Um, this team is also going to be responsible for doing that billing training, like I had indicated before. So primarily we'll be focusing on when we bring new providers on, um, showing them initially how to do their billing. But I know that we get lots of questions or sometimes um, there can be turnover within the agencies themselves and we're asked for some additional training. Um, this team will be tasked with um, helping with those additional training requests. Um, we're going to be doing the youth Medicaid eligibility monitoring, which started just a couple of months ago. I believe uh, February or March was the first month that we did this. And that's just really identified, identifying those individuals that are um, in that 18 to 19 age range where they are looking to um, you know, change the, the Medicaid benefit that they are currently under. And we wanna make sure that they are um, we're identifying that they do need to be looked at and we do need to send in those additional um, requests to make sure that they get the appropriate Medicaid um, to support their needs. Um, so this team will be tracking um, those uh, responses as well. This group will do the variances, voids and rebills, any shared unit billing that we do and any billing and rate changes. Um, this group also, um, is in charge of the um, help desk. So whenever um, a Seymour um, help desk ticket is sent in, um, that does also go to this group as well. So that's um, a lot of information. Um, primarily just wanted to let everyone know um, that we are looking to make this change and we are going to start breaking out the Medicaid billing team um, in the coming months. So you will see some changes um, the big one, I think, for everyone on this um, call is just to know that we are going to move towards trying to utilize these group mailboxes so that we can do some tracking. And um, primarily, we would like to use the mailbox just to make sure that we are staying on top of our inquiries and making sure that uh, that responses are being received in a timely manner as well. So that is all I have to share. Let me see what kind of questions we have. Um, let's see, um, I have um, shared this PowerPoint on some other calls, but um, I think this can, I don't know if these are saved um, down with the recordings or if that's something we can send out, but we, we definitely can get that out to provider agencies if that would be helpful and TCMs as well.
Yeah, we can post this with the recording. That's not a problem. Um, we um, have not looked at doing um, the, a phone list. We would like to primarily stay with um, the email group uh, just to make sure that um, we are able to track those responses. And um, another thing too is, you know, if you have someone that uh, one person that you typically would work with with your billing questions and they go out, say, on medical leave, then, you know, you're kind of stuck and you don't really know who else to reach out to. And, you know, they might be out for weeks at a time. And so this kind of ensures that we have proper coverage for everything. I'm not saying that we can't have some um, phone conversations, especially as things get more complicated with some of the um, rate changes, particularly. Um, and I can I will go ahead and put those um, email boxes in um, the chat if that would be helpful. Um, but they will be, Heike will save these down, um, these uh, PowerPoint slides down that have the email addresses as well. I think that is it for me. So, Leslie, I believe you um, are next. Thanks, Jackie. Good morning, everyone. I'm Leslie Bradley with the Federal Programs Unit. I just have a few reminders and updates for you. The federal COVID PHE ended May 11th, and all 1135 flexibilities ended on May 11th of 2023 as well. So, for example, that would be verbal signatures. Appendix K flexibilities will expire in six months on November 11th of 2023, and providers should evaluate Appendix K flexibilities and use this time to resume normal operations. A few waiver updates, the Partnership for Hope and MoKID waiver renewals were submitted to CMS in April and the division responded to CMS questions on May 17th. The division expects CMS will approve the waivers by July 1st of 2023. Training for waiver changes will be provided upon CMS approval of both waiver applications. So changes in the renewals included making remote supports a standalone service. We added virtual delivery of service requirements for five employment services, which included supported employment, benefits planning, career planning, job development, and prevoke services, as well as a physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. We updated environmental accessibility adaptations, home vehicle modification service definition to clarify provider requirements and clarify use of service funds for provider owned leased vehicle adaptations and vehicle maintenance. We removed assistive technology provider type from personal assistant definition. For applied behavior analysis, we increased the maximum unit amounts for behavior identification assessment and behavior identification supporting assessment observational. We added QHCP provider type to adaptive behavior treatment by protocol by technician. We updated the UR committee to UR process to match the updated CSR. We clarified that the MOS or Missouri Adaptive Ability Scale as the standard instrument for determining substantial func functional limitation and we added two additional enhanced value-based payments, which included the completion of electronic Missouri person-centered thinking training and electronic advanced fatal five plus training. Those were the reminders and updates I had. Let me see, I don't see anything in the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to Jess Bateman. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let me work on sharing my screen here. Okay. All right, so happy Friday. Um, my name is Jess Bateman and I am the new director of intake assessment and utilization review. And I'm really excited to share this information with you. So on behalf of the entire assessment leadership team, 
thank you for the role that you have played, the patience that you have had, and the support that you have given us as we continue to um, refine and transform how we serve. Um, so I thought first we could take a look at some behind the scenes transformations and um, I love a good analogy. So I like to think of these as downs in a football um, game. So, you know, the first three downs are smaller achievements. And even though, you know, they're not the Hail Mary excitement on their own, they still can result in some game winning touchdowns. Um, so some things that I think are noteworthy um, and that we should celebrate together um, are the talent wins um, that we have had. Um, so since this past December, we have had 10 new team members join the assessment team. Um, that is a lot of knowledge, experience, and dedication. Honestly, it is immeasurable. Um, so out of all of the assessors that have joined our team, um, Almost all of them have gained their certification and are now completing assessments um, on their own. Um, so in addition to the six new assessors that we've had, we also have a new assessor supervisor, um, a new assessor director, that's me, and some administrative support, and even two amazing colleagues outside of the assessment team that are helping us out on the interim. So really excellent citizens serving fellow citizens, as Governor Parson would say. Um, so this month we rolled out an assessment support line. Um, you'll see the number there. Um, so we heard from you. We knew that we needed a real person right then and there live to help our service coordinators, families, troubleshoot issues with logging on to our virtual assessments um, or even booking an appointment in Calendly because of te technical difficulties. Um, so we are very grateful um, that we had someone who was willing and volunteered to step up and um, uh, answer that call. Um, and so we are ready um, for you. And so um, I encourage you to save this number um, as a favorite and make sure that you share this with families too. Um, we also know um, that um, uh, the lives of those that we serve and their families, they don't just operate on a Monday through Friday, eight to five closed all state and federal holiday schedule. So in order for us to be flexible and accommodate when families need it, we have a team member, um, I'm sorry, we have multiple team members scheduling evening appointments, weekend appointments, state holiday appointments, um, et cetera. So it's really benefited our families and it's helped to benefit our own assessment team members too. And we are really grateful um, for that. So we've all heard, um, you know, Calendly is book solid. There is not an opening to schedule an assessment. And yes, that is the reality today. Um, but I did want to go over an unfortunate contributing factor as to why that's happening. And that is duplicate assessments. So what I mean by that is there are multiple assessment slots being booked for one individual. So only one assessment is needed, but they are taking up 21 slots. Um, no joke, that has actually happened. Um, at this time, there is not a system safeguard to prevent duplicate bookings from happening. Um, we're working on some alternatives to that. But in the meantime, um, we do have someone who has graciously volunteered to pull a report every single day, review that, see if there are any individuals that are showing up with duplicate assessments and trying to contact the service coordinators, families, anyone um, necessary so that we can um, get all of those unnecessary appointments 
off of Calendly so that other people can can schedule those. Um, and another thing, you know, that we're hearing, and I think that we all know is time is a luxury that we just don't seem to have enough of. Um, there's only so much time in a day. Um, and we only have so many resources, so we need to make sure that we are spending our precious time wisely. Um, so the leadership team, we realized that there were times we were completing full assessments um, when really it honestly was not necessary for a full reassessment to be done. So going forward, if an individual has a valid assessment, meaning an assessment that has been completed within the last two years, um, the assessment leadership team is simply just going to update priority of need scores in situations where that is the only change. Um, so we're not going to do a whole nother assessment just for those situations. Um, so again, it's a win for the individual because they're not having to go through another assessment unnecessarily. It's a win for you and it's a win for us. So we're going to continue to look for ways um, on how we can make sure that we are only completing assessments when absolutely necessary. Um, and leadership's time is also, you know, very valuable and we have to make sure that we are being accessible and, um, you know, we, we can't be everywhere, know how to do everything and be available to everyone 24 seven. You, you get the point with that. So we went back to the drawing board because we also heard from you and we felt, you know, that we were not responding back to you timely um, or as timely as we really strive to be. Um, so what we're going to do is narrow down our leadership focus and we've specialized our supervisors responsibilities. And so they own very specific pieces um, and um, to, uh, you know, help um, resolve and um, get things going faster. So thank you for helping us learn and um, grow too, because if nothing changes, then nothing changes. So we also have um, some additional upcoming transformations that we are working on. Um, to maximize our operations, enhance our impact, and, and transform the way we serve. So our assessment team is also going to be specializing. So we know that we need to ensure that we complete assessments by priority of need, not just the date received. So to effectively staff all of the assessment needs to the best of our capacity at this point, we're going to have three specialty teams. One team for intake assessments, one team for critical situation assessments, and then one team for um, level of care needs and other standard routine assessments. Um, so, of course, we are going, um, we do anticipate needing to make adjustments as far as um, the amount of assessors on each team because needs ebb and flow. And so we want to um, be flexible with that too. Um, we're also going to be tapping into some additional features within Calendly um, to make sure that the people scheduling appointments schedule with the right team. Um, so, by adding one additional step that is honestly super fast and super efficient, Calendly will automatically route the scheduler to the appropriate team's calendar. So, super easy and super efficient for all. Um, so, in an effort to keep up with the assessment demand, we filled our days with back-to-back -back assessments. I'm talking, you know, eight to five, one assessment right after the other. And we did that because we knew that assessments were needed timely. That did have an unintended consequence though, um, which is the lack of flexibility within our schedule right now to account for new, urgent, unplanned, um, critical situation type of needs. Um, so, Starting in July, what we are going to do is 
schedule protected time for each of our team members, um, 90 minutes a day where there is, um, they have free time outside of Calendly um, so that when we do have those cases come up, last week we had over 70 alone, we have the built-in flexibility to be able to address those very timely. Um, another significant hurdle that we are going to tackle head on in the very near future is trying to reduce the amount of no call, no shows to appointments. Um, up to uh, actually right around 25% of our um, assessments that are scheduled right now result in a no, in a no call, no show. And um, if that number doesn't seem high to you, I promise you when we're scheduled for 90 minutes per assessment, 25%, um, that's a significant amount of time that we could be doing assessments that were not because of the no call, no show. Um, we're also going to try and come up with a new way so you can reserve time to speak with the assessment leadership team. Um, our goal is to be responsive to you within 72 business hours. We know that we may not be able to resolve situations, um, but we do hope to connect back with you within 72 hours and um, give you an update on where we're at with your need. So um, I've alluded to this a couple different times now, but we have a new assessment scheduling process that is set to go live and officially launch on July the 3rd. Um, so we are aware of the scheduling limitations and restrictions in um, Calendly right now. Um, right now, there is no additional time beyond August to schedule assessments, and that is intentional because the existing practice is not conducive for anyone. Intake specialists, support coordinators, assessment specialists, and ultimately those that we serve. So we recognize that we have an opportunity to pivot and re-strategize a more effective process. So a new scheduling method within Calendly is in the final stages of construction. I was actually putting um, um, a little bit of tweaks here and there right before this call, and we are going to enter into a pilot or a testing phase with our intake team next week um, so that we can hopefully work out anything that needs worked out before we um, share the new scheduling link going live. Um, so, um, you know, again, assessments are literally booked um, back to back until the end of August. So when this link goes live in July, you will be able to schedule the routine standard appointments um, for September. Um, in the meantime, we know that there are going to be those critical situations and we have a plan to address that in this transition period. Um, so a form, a PDF form has been created that will be shared widely very, very soon. And um, it is for the purpose of sending in critical situation request um, to the leadership team for review and help with scheduling outside of Calendly. Um, this form has a pretty cool feature. At the end of it, it has a submit button. And for those who have the Adobe software on their computer, it will automatically um, generate an encrypted email with that form attached for you um, to our um, um, Moss inbox. So super efficient, super easy. All you have to do is hit submit and then send. Um, and for those who don't have that um, or your um, organization requires some additional encryption, measures, you can still, um, you know, uh, attach the form um, just the, the manual way, so.
All right, so um, I hope that you're excited as we are We're working on a lot of things and we know that we need to stabilize and sustain to enhance our operations. And we are going to strategically roll out new protocols and processes step by step. Um, we're committed to rebuilding your trust of the assessment process. And, you know, we're reconfiguring the way that assessments are prioritized, scheduled, and assigned. And we're also committing to more effective communication channels. So, um, again, I appreciate your patience and your support. Um, and with all of these things that we've talked about here today, um, you know, the goal is not to be perfect. None of these solutions are going to be perfect. Um, but the goal is not to be perfect. It's just to be better um, tomorrow than what we are today. So um, thank you very much for that. And if you have any questions, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming up on the chat um, here. If I can't get to all of them, send your questions um, to this account. We do have someone who um, is monitoring that account every single day. And again, our goal is to get a response to you within 72 business hours. Um, so thank you for what you do and take care. And I am going to pass it off to Leslie D. Hello, thank you so much, Jess. Um, those are exciting updates and thanks for all your hard work, you and your team's hard work. Um, uh, happy Friday, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I just have a review of Hearst updates and some uh, summertime health um, items that I just like to share as resources. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, hang on just a second. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen okay? Yes, we can, okay. Leslie. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm uh, Leslie DeGroat. I'm your uh, Division Statewide Clinical Coordinator, and I'm just going to kind of review some recent updates that we have had with the process and just some reminders. Um, so effective May 1st, um, this month of 2023, the division implemented statewide um, health risk screening process for all 1915C waiver participants. Um, during statewide implementation, all division contracted residential service providers and TCM agencies will begin the health risk screening process for individuals that they, they serve and that um, will all align with the individual's um, ISP or individual support planning process. Um, the MoDD Hearst process is to have full implementation of all waiver participants by May of 2024, and the division has defined implementation as the initiation of the process by the designated um, Hearst Rater. So how to get started if you're out there and you haven't started onboarding yet, haven't gotten your access or completed trainings, that's okay. Um, you know, we, we'll, we'll support you through that. Um, this right here is just, to, I'll show you on the webpage here in just a, in just a jiffy where to get started, but um, there, there we have a designated division webpage and we have different ribbons that describe like one is for residential service providers, one's for support coordinators, and one's for day habilitation and employment services. And that has um, information on getting started. Each of those uh, ribbons has an onboarding process diagram because ideally you could flip a switch and everyone would have access, but there's some informational, just brief recordings that you'll need to review and then submit your agency information in the system and just a few other steps in order for everything to align properly and for us to be able to activate your agency in your account and then and provide access to what's called a gatekeeper for your agency. Um, so, so, so um, you'll watch that recorded uh, um, webinar that's underneath that ribbon. There is a survey link that you will complete. It's a red cap survey and it just asks agency name, contact information, and then who you want to be your gatekeepers. And the gatekeeper, just to let you know, that's who kind of controls who is active in the account in your agency and who needs to be deactivated, just kind of staying on top of that. 
uh, at your local level. Um, after that's completed, an email will, will, will come back to you and, and there will be a recorded webinar, um, two for residential service providers and two for support coordinators. Um, it reviews uh, what to look for, you know, what, what to look forward to, and then also the utilization review process for those additional RN hours, just, you know, for your information. And uh, after you're completed, after you've after you've actually submitted your survey and and clicked on the button, um, uh, our division gatekeeper will um, request your gatekeeper's account. So uh, we tried to streamline this based on feedback to where it occurs uh, more it's more efficient than previous. And so, but if you have questions, you can reach out, and I'll get to the where, where you can reach out and some enhancements for our email boxes as well. So um, just for FYI, um, the HERS training, the process trainings, um, each role uh, for each user has designated trainings, and those trainings are located in the intellectability system. Um, so, and we encourage team members to focus uh, while they're doing their training, because this is really, this is building the foundation for the, for the team members and the users. Um, you, the users will have access to all trainings after um, the gatekeeper requests their account. So the, they'll receive an email from Hearst online, be able to uh, create their uh, 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 password login, and then the trainings will pop up. And they're only one-time trainings and they will stay in the person's um, training library forever. Like they can always go back and refer to it if they need to for a refresher because you know it's new system new process and and it's you know you can't remember everything um so that those are there for reference i'm gonna look at my notes make sure i said everything let's see um that i want to remind people about the value-based payment incentive um, health risk screening tools that were, you know, that were completed fiscal year 2023. So that's July 1st of 2022 on through um, June 30th of 2023. Received that one time payment of 7240 per completed screen. And we do have the, there we have a division webpage in, solely for value-based payments. And then also a mailbox. Um, and if even if you reach out to the MoDD Hearst, I'll, I'll try to answer, but I'll probably for more specific value-based payment questions, I'll refer you to that mailbox because they're the experts in that area. Um, but just didn't want you to, to uh, I wanted to remind you about that. Um, we were able to take feedback from implementation phase one of the process and make some enhancements. And I just wanted to kind of pop that up there for you. Um, this enhancements in regard to timelines um, to, to provide an additional month to support process completion prior to the annual individual support plan implementation month. It's kind of confusing at first because you say, oh, it's May. We start doing it in May for October. Actually, um, so you implement, well, this is where you start prepping for the rating and screening, you gather information. Then in June, um, that's when the um, screen will take place. The next month you will, if there are any applicable health risk support plans, those will be completed. And then, so that's month one, two, and then September and October, um, August and September will be plenty of time for the support coordinators to, to you know, uh, complete any service authorizations or, you know, just complete their part of it, you know, so that everything can be all good and ready to go um, by, by that October ISP implementation. So if you follow this, if you, ha if you're, if you have access to the system now, um, it will come up on the message of the day. So you can always kind of clip that and save it, but please, you know, follow this and you'll, you'll do just fine and get everybody screened uh, by October, 2024. I'm gonna look at my notes real quick. I think that's all I wanted to say on that. Um, so declination to participate, we receive feedback from support coordinators because you know a person may not be interested or, or if they have caregivers or family, maybe they're not, you know, they're like, oh no, I don't know about all this. Well, um, that's okay. And, and for so for non-residential um, waiver participants, um, as a support coordinator, you need their input and inform, you know, for them to help you with the information in order to answer yes or no to the questions. If you don't have them helping you, then you won't be able to do it. So we have finalized um, in the in the her in the intellectability or her system um, 
um, a declination form and also current support coordinators should have that training in their training library and it's it's like recommended and it's only I think about gosh I want to say six minutes long so it's not super long and it tells you exactly you know what to do what to document in the ISP healthy living section and where to go in the system in order to complete that and just FYI too if they don't if the individual or family or whomever doesn't want to do it right now like you know follow the first process, they can always change their mind. Like that's A-OK, -okay. they can change their mind um, at any time. So just wanted to let you know that. And, OK, my notes there. Um, we do have support uh, emails, um, modhurstproject at dmh.mo.gov. Um, we went back to the table to strategize on how to answer your questions and get you direct responses quicker. We we had an automatic replies that you know kind of can point you to Mo support um, if for technical issues and then Mo clinicists for screening and clinical review support. Just you know in case that was more your what you were needing. Um, do you know we've had a lot of an influx of questions, which is awesome. We, we want to hear from you. We want your questions. We want your feedback. We have strategized just this morning on a, be, on a better plan to get you those direct responses within one to two business days. So I appreciate your patience through all this and I appreciate your feedback. You know what I mean? It's, it's so valuable. So starting next week, you should, you should see a difference in our response time. And again, I apologize uh, for delays, um, but we're, we're working on it and I think we got a good solid plan. So so next week, <laughs> but but yeah, we're, we'll we'll be you know, putting that into play um, actually today. Um, so the like I said, Mo DD Hearst Project at dmh.mo.gov. Reach out anytime. Um, then the Mo Support at replacingrisk.com for technical issues, and then again that Mo Clin Assist at replacing risk.com for the for any screen or rating type of issues um intellectability has a designated team for missouri and they're with us forever so and this mailbox is with us forever so please don't be out there struggling by yourselves please reach out um with that being said i just have a couple things to share i don't know how we're doing on time i hope let's see hang on here let me make sure okay this is that okay? Okay, I, I don't have too much more. This is our our, our web page. Um, you can go here. We'll drop that in the chat. Um, the the email. You can always click on there and go to it. We have um, for phase one, which was March twenty twenty one through April thirtieth of twenty twenty three. That's that's the process doc for that. And then here's the updated version of phase two, which started May first. So you might want to review that if you haven't. Frequently asked questions. Um, I'm uh, currently updating the document. There's a lot, like it has the training list, it has all kinds of different questions in there. It's like eight pages long right now. It's about to get longer, but that's awesome, right? And so keep your questions coming. We like those. We like to gather them and have them, you know, so we can publish them out there. Um, we do have a, we're about to add some things for information for individuals and families, um, some resources. Here is the residential service provider agency tab, and then it looks similar to support coordination in DAHAB, but each one has this first onboarding process, uh, process flow diagram, so that you'll have those steps in there for, if you haven't gotten access yet, it'll be right there. But we're about to add also a few more resources for support coordinators under here, you know, just bringing up the topic with individuals and families. Um, hey, this is this new tool and this, that, and the other, you know, just to kind of help with that, because it's sort of hard to bring up new stuff, you know, and it's, you know, and we don't want everybody to be like, I mean, we don't want the families to be like, oh, one more thing, oh my gosh, you know, which it is one more thing, but we really find benefit with it and we want to help support that conversation. So, you know, anyway, so, uh, I'm going to go to the next topic. It's kind of a, a kind of a switch here, but really, you know, summer's coming up. Yesterday was the last day of school for my children, so we've got summer fun, of course. And I just wanted to point you to the CDC website. They have all kinds of cool stuff for any about anything. But here's tips for a healthy summer. Move more, sit less. Of course, we you know we know that. Um, get at least 150 minutes of aerobic physical activity every week, and it doesn't mean you have to go do the the 20 minute workout or whatever. You can uh, take a walk. That'll get your heart rate going. Um, see, uh, wear sunscreen and insect repellent. And here's a tip here that I didn't realize: apply sunscreen before insect repellent. After you come indoors, check your body, clothing, body, and pets for ticks. Be careful of those ticks. They're bad this year. And reapply sunscreen after two hours and after swimming, sweating, or toweling off. 
And here it reminds us that physical activity has immediate benefits for your health, better sleep and reduction of anxiety. Those are just two of them. So get out, take it. It doesn't even have to be a long walk, 10 minute walk, you know, just, yeah, take care of yourselves, people. You guys are doing very important work out there and we want you to be healthy. So please don't forget to take care of yourselves. Um, keep cool in extreme heat. Um, don't push yourself. If it's hot out there, don't push it having to go outside and do stuff. Thank goodness we're in the land of air conditioning. I don't know how people lived before that. It's got reminders of stuff that we all know. Eat healthy food. Choose your drinks wisely. Uh, don't quit tobacco. Or don't quit tobacco. <laughs> don't use tobacco. Although it is really, it is hard to quit. Um, so anyway, just they they have some little more detailed tips too in order to how, how to incorporate that in your lives because you know it's hard to make changes, but even just one little change at a time is that's good. Um, one uh, divi the last thing, um, our health and safety page for the division, we uh, have alerts and updates, and we have these uh, informational documents, and you can always download them, print them off, share them with with, with staff, you know, individuals, families, anyone can can look at them. And one we have specifically preventing heat related illness. That's pretty topical for the summer. You know, just identifying. You know, when it's too hot outside. Uh, you know, maintain, you know, the cooling measures, but then um, also don't let yourself get overheated. And if you happen to, what are the signs of it? You know, different medications that people take can influence a person's body physiological response to the sun and heat. And it might, you know, it might be more dangerous. So just if you, if you, if you can uh, check out some of these, if you ever have any ideas for topics, give us a holler. I'd be glad to, to gather information and research and put it, Put the best practices and you know different things on there for 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 help in any way and um uh that's that's all i have to share at this juncture i'm not sure how we're doing on okay we're over time stop sharing um i i want to thank you all for joining us today we appreciate all of your efforts for supporting people with an, you know intellectual and developmental disabilities um and just have a lovely lovely weekend and don't ever hesitate to reach out Thanks, Leslie. I'll echo what you said. Everyone have a wonderful weekend and we appreciate you sticking with us for this hour and all the updates that we had to share this month. Thank you.